Hello, and welcome back to Sociology 101. We're going to be talking about provisionism and how it's represented by those who don't agree with us. Um, sometimes it's uh, represented in very bad ways, as we've explored with uh, Dr. James White, for example. Uh, he is one of uh, the worst at representing us, unfortunately. He's, uh, he's not a good faith interlocutor in that sense. He's not trying to represent us correctly, from what I can tell. But there are others out there who are being more fair in their representations. Some of them may be missing the mark a little bit, but not intentionally, uh, like it seems like others are doing. It some, sometimes it seems like people are trying to misrepresent us uh, in order to boogeyman us or to the scare tactics and all these kinds of things or to, uh, you know, to make us sound as bad as possible. And that, that's just not a good faith interlocutor. Right? It's not wise probably to uh, waste too much time uh, dealing with those who who aren't willing to at least understand you before they engage with you. As, as, as I've heard it said, it, you need to be able to first say, I understand before you can say, I disagree. And you need to honestly strive to understand the other side. Now, I know I've been accused of not understanding Calvinism, but of course, Calvinism is not a monolithic group. There are many different types of Calvinists. And I, I dare say anyone who would like to take up this challenge to find anyone uh, from the Calvinist side that is a notable Calvinistic scholar online doing broadcast or something of that sort that has uh, done as much as I have done for Calvinists to properly represent them, having them on the program, playing them for themselves in their own words, uh, reading from their confessions and their documents and their books. Um, very few uh, Calvinists are willing to do that for, for us, and we are doing that for them on a regular basis. And so I'm, I'm trying to set the standard high as far as our engagement. Have I always been perfect of that? Of course not. I, I have uh, many times gone back and said, ah, I probably should have said this instead. These words probably aren't the best words. I should have said this or this. You know, that's going to happen when you're doing live broadcasting. You're going to say things that you wish you to put differently. That's just a part of it. But Today, I wanted just to, to kind of walk through, and I'm going to be engaging with some of the side chat. I see Nathan Clark's here. Um, Richard, I see you there. Um, thank you guys for your comments. Good morning to you, rock and roll there. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm seeing that, and uh, and I'm, I'm going to just try to represent some some forms of non, non-provisionist, people who don't agree with us, representing or talking about us in, in live broadcasts or on blogs. And the two interlocutors that I've kind of chosen for today, well, really three, one, Got Questions, that it's a behemoth website that usually comes up anytime you type in a theological question, two, um, or, uh, Tyler Vela, uh, who, by the way, in the clip that I'm going to play, doesn't do an unfair job. I mean, he's, he's I'm going to nitpick him a little bit because some of the verbiage, but I think he's actually striving to, uh, to represent us pretty fairly in this exchange, at least, with a vocab alone. And then I'm also going to to, to uh, engage with Roger Olson, who is a, is a well-known Armenian, classical Armenian, who does a, a very kind job in representing us and and very cordial in the way he does so. And I really, really appreciate that. Uh, got questions, in fact, is, is fairly fair and cordial as well. And so these are, these are people who are, I think, um, trying to or striving to represent provisionism uh, in, a, in a, at least somewhat fair way. Um, and maybe missing a couple of things or nuancing some things that we may want to nuance a little differently. And going through this may help you as the audience, those who may be exploring provisionism, trying to understand it better, uh, can can uh, kind of go through this and look at the more mi- minor details. So this is for our theology geeks who like to go into the weeds, into the details. Before we jump into that, let me remind you what's scrolling there on the bottom of the screen that keeps us going. We are a listener-supported broadcast. And so our patrons um, are one-time donors, any of those who who help us to spread the news of God's love and provision, I just want to say thank you for for giving. And if uh, you'd like to join our team, you can click on that support link in the show notes or go to Sociology 101 in the top right corner. You can find a support link there and click on Donate Now. There's an app called Zelle that doesn't take out any fees. Unlike PayPal and uh, some of the other sources, Zelle is actually free for you to donate to the ministry. Uh, and we are a 501c3 overseen by the foundation group. If you're interested in giving, we would appreciate that. Also, you can see a class link there at Sociology 101 telling you more about Trinity Seminary, where you can get a higher theological education. We encourage you to take a look at that as well. What is provisionism under Got Questions? And so even Got Questions, I guess, was getting enough people asking <laughs> what is provisionism that they felt that they needed to put a, a page up talking about this. And this was months ago, if not years ago, that they did this. So this has been here for a while. 
Uh, in fact, in a, another episode, I think we go through this, and I critique it a little bit, but for the most part, if you read through this, they do a fairly a good job of representing what uh, provisionism entails. I wish they'd em emphasized some things more than others, but nevertheless, uh, they, they mentioned my name as, as the one who kind of coined the term and uh, even uh, put my book and uh, the, the website there for, for places you can go see. And so that's a fair representation. Hey, go read a provisionist for himself. Here's his sources. Um, and one thing, I, and he, he, they even go through provide acrostic here. Uh, but one thing I really appreciated is this last sentence. It says, Christians have often debated the finer points of how human will and God's sovereignty interact when it comes to salvation. Though the nuances of provisionism may not be accepted by particular believers, its tenets are well within the realm of Orthodox Christian theology. And so you can see there that the, the leaders of Got Questions, whoever they may be, um, are at least fair enough to say these guys are not heretics. These guys are not some far off weird branch out there. These are represented by more of a traditional Southern Baptist approach to soteriology that we have uh, expounded upon um, in more detail in other episodes. So I, I appreciate um, uh, at least some uh, some uh, some fairness when it comes to representation because we have seen so much that's not fair. Um, you know, taking quotes out of context, taking twenty second clips on Twitter, um, you know, blowing up uh, you know certain words and, and trying to make them mean things that they don't mean. And y'all all know what I'm talking about when I say that. And that's the kind of thing we want to try. Uh, to, to avoid in representing and talking about uh, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so um, hopefully um, we, we will do a good job at that as well. And we we're all striving to do that. But um, I want you to listen first and foremost to uh, Tyler and uh, Vocab Malone. I went on Vocab's program, by the way, follow up to the, the Vela, Tyler Vela conversation. And so if you want to go watch that on Vocab's page, it was an interesting conversation. It got a little tense uh, in a couple of moments where I think uh, maybe uh, Vocab was misunderstanding uh, my intention because I was referencing a kind of emotive kind of evil like uh, rape and molestations. And the reason I was doing so is because I was referring back to a Piper quote that does the same thing uh, in regard to the, the heart of a king. And he, he kind of, I think he maybe took that the wrong way or took that as, as being uh, uh, too provocative, I guess, for his program. And uh, he, he, he had took some issue with me on that. But we, we worked it out, and we ended up, uh, I think, leaving on good terms or uh, departing on good terms. And I think you can go hear that discussion for yourself and decide for yourself if, if I, I, I was being fair to him and uh, he was being fair to me. But I like vocab overall. I think he's, he's kind of one of those cool Calvinists that seems to um, – really get along with all sides and, and all groups of people, uh, the kind of guy that gets probably gets along real well with even atheists and uh, unbelievers because he's the kind of guy that's real approachable and, and able to have conversations, which we need that in the kingdom. We need people who are able to cross uh, bridges like that, and uh, he, he seems to do that very well. Um, now, Tyler, on the other hand, we've had some back-and-forth interactions that aren't all that positive, um, and, and Tyler is a hardcore, I mean, determinist, and he, he he's very intellectual. Uh, he's he's very uh, good with uh, explaining his position, um, and and here in this broadcast, you may think, well, I'm going to be using Tyler as my foil here to say, look at how not to represent provisionists. But actually, th there are only a couple of issues I have with Tyler. It really does seem here that he's trying talking to vocab to represent our position fairly. Now, I would have issues with the semi-Pelagian label as we'll go through, but. Besides that, he, he does a, a fairly good job of trying to uh, trying to nuance where we differ from Armenians. And so I'll let you listen to that for yourself. Here it is. So uh, Soteriology 101, I, I thought he would kind of affirm like a classic Wesleyan Arminian Soteriology, but I'm getting a little confused by the no, platforming a, of the open theists. Yeah, he's a provisionist. He's not a, he's not an Arminian. So, so this is a common misunderstanding. Uh, I know I hear them say that, but you, you find the difference valid? Yep. Okay. It's very, it's very valid. And, and, and it's meaningful because there's a reason why Arminians are not semi Pelagian, but provisionists are. Right. Because. Uh, okay. So this is, again, this is where I would take a, a issue with Tyler is that he's still insisting that provisionism by definition is semi Pelagian. Um, but of course, that's been contended with. We have we have brought not only just it's not just like oh don't call us that we don't like it you know and it, it's just making us upset you're you know like we're it's just an emotional thing that we just don't like to be called something. 
it's just factually incorrect. Um, and I know Tyler's big on facts. Tyler's big on knowing your history and knowing facts. And this is this is one of those those things that I'm going to you know call him on. He's not factually correct because of some of the things that we're going to hear Roger Olson explain and um, other even Armenians who know their history a little bit better maybe than Tyler does. Um, and so this is one of the things that I I've pointed out uh, quite a number of times, obviously, in other broadcasts, but I, I want you to see it for yourself here. Uh, this is from Adam Harwood's uh, article, is traditional Southern Baptist, you know, traditional statement, is it semi-Pelagian? And he goes through and, and, and shows, using sources, actual historical sources, defining semi-Pelagian um, and what it is, um, and then showing what that we, how we contradict that, how we don't agree with the major tenet of what semi-Pelagianism entails. And that is basically, if, and matter of fact, I could read through all of these, the Oxford Dictionary, the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, the Integrative Theology, but let's just go right to the Westminster Dictionary of Christian Theology because it's the Calvinistic source, okay? So this is a source that I would think Tyler would see as authoritative and as a good source that is not biased because it's obviously Calvinistic. And so the Westminster Dictionary says uh, semi-Pelagianism is defined as a term which has been used to describe several theories which were thought to imply that the first movement towards God is made by human effort unaided by grace, end quote, okay? We absolutely deny that. We do not believe that uh, we, we, we make the first movement toward God unaided by grace. We believe that his grace must initiate and that he does so, does so through means. That is just a fact of the matter. And so you may say there are some things that we have said that are similar to what semi-Pelagians have said, Fine, just like we could say some things that Tyler say are similar to what Gnostics have said. So, does that make you a semi-Gnostic? I, I don't think you would want that label. Well, then why would you give that label to me if, if just because I say something that's similar to what some semi-Pelagians said, therefore I wear the label semi-Pelagianism, even though I don't affirm the major tenet of what is known to be semi-Pelagian? You don't affirm the major tenets that are known to be Gnosticism. Yet, would it be fair for me to call you a semi-Gnostic because you say some things that are similar to what some Gnostics said? Of course not. That's not a fair way. Uh, it's not a. Uh, it's not a fair way to represent your opponent, which we've been over before. But I, I just wanted to make sure that that's that's very clear. All right, moving on. Because uh, Arminians are semi-Pelagians. Ar Arminians affirm. Uh, they they actually affirm total depravity, even if they don't affirm a, a full or total inability. And so the Arminians are going to historically say it does take provenient grace. It takes a special act of the Holy Spirit upon the nature of man to enable faith, to allow for faith, to make faith possible. The provisionist is a semi-Pelagian specifically because they say, well, no, the initium fide, the, the initial step of faith, doesn't require this supernatural act of God upon the unbeliever. They deny that. Okay, so it doesn't require a supernatural act of God upon the unbeliever. Now, you're going to hear that again and again also when we get to the Roger Olson stuff, okay, because whatever the supernatural act of God is, is defined differently by different Wesleyan Arminians, classical Arminian, Arminius himself, Olson versus Abishano versus uh, Matthew Pinson versus uh, Sh Sh Sheldon, who we, we've talked about. All of them have differing ways in which they describe what that is, okay? Now, for Tyler, obviously, as a determinist, a Calvinistic determinist, this supernatural act is some effectual, irresistible call upon those unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world. And uh, this unconditional, uh, uh, effectual work uh, certainly causes the elect to believe by changing of their nature, making their nature from dead to alive. And it's an ontological change of nature. Now, no Arminian is arguing for that, obviously, because they're not Calvinists. They're not arguing for this unilateral work of God that effectually causes people to believe uh, on any of those those forms of grace. But there are different nuances as to what that supernatural work of grace is. Now, the reason I take issue with this is not because I don't understand what he means or what Roger Olson or others mean when they talk about a supernatural work of God or the Spirit upon a man, uh, because I, I think I get what they're intending by that. But my my nitpick here, if you want to call it that, is to say I, I believe Jesus coming and dying on the cross and resurrecting was supernatural, don't you? And it's necessary to be saved. <laughs> it's it's a prevenient grace. And that's what prevenient grace is. Prevenient grace is a grace that comes before that's necessary. Well, I believe it was necessary for Christ to come and to die for us to be saved. 
I believe the inspiration of the gospel was necessary for us to believe in Jesus, because how will they believe in one whom they've not heard? And how will they uh, hear without a preacher? And how will the preachers go unless they're sent? Romans chapter 10. So none of those things can happen without the provenient workings of God's grace to inspire his word through the apostles, to distribute his word, um, to indwell Christians, the church, the bride, and to inspire and to help and to guide them to go and to proclaim these truths? Is that not supernatural? I think it is. And so, in other words, supernatural is not a sufficient descriptive word to distinguish between our two perspectives because we also believe in a prevenient coming before, aiding of God's grace that's supernatural. We just don't believe that it is a um, it is a uh, unmediated or, or yeah unmediated direct work of the Holy Spirit ontologically changing the nature of humanity, making them into something they were not before, uh, changing like like the Calvinists will say some kind of a giving them a new heart in order for them to be able to confess that they used to have a bad heart you know th- this kind of of, of stuff. Uh, pre-faith regeneration kind of, of thing, this ontological change of your very being, of your very nature, in order to to give you back your humanity, in a sense, almost to give you back your imago day, to be able to 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 think and to reason in a in a, a reasonable thinking way that actually is meaningful for you to be able to actually respond to God. Now, you can respond to any other thing out there. You can respond to demons. You can respond to false teachings. You can respond to even to other true things like your history book or your science book or your algebra. You can respond to all those things in a positive way. But the one thing you were born unable to respond positively to in a meaningful way is the Bible. You just can't without whatever this ontological change of nature is. That to me is just a, a bridge too far. That is really, really, really a high bar for anybody, in my estimation, to to try to explain or to 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 defend biblically, at least. Now, I can understand the concepts of it, but I I, I don't see any kind of biblical backing for that perspective. And I, I'm not trying to misrepresent the perspective. That's why we're letting them speak for themselves. And I, and we're going to go to we're, we're getting into the weeds here in a little bit. Trust me, we're go, go we're going going to go to Roger Olson's uh, article on this and 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 look at the comment section, which that's you want to get into weeds. You were to get into the comment section under theological, you know, uh, article blog articles on, on a page like Dr. Roger Olson's, and you'll get right into the weeds. So we'll, we'll get there, but let's let's listen to what Tyler goes on to say here. That just is what makes them uh, semi-Pelagian, where Arminians aren't. So provision is. By the way, I've I've got quotes from Sproul and articles and other places. I think both Sproul, MacArthur have all called. Armenians, known Armenians, Pelagians at some point. Sometimes just plain old Pelagian, not even semi-Pelagian. I have quotes from them calling them that. If you think that by becoming a classical Armenian, that you're going to avoid the label of Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism by most of the Calvinistic scholars out there, then you're just duping yourself. They're going to call you that whether it's right or wrong. Why? Because they have been doing that since the word was invented by Beza in the 1500s. They... He was calling the Molinist at that time, Pelagians or semi-Pelagians. And, and a label is in the eye of the beholder, just like when you call somebody a, a fundamentalist or you call somebody a liberal or you call somebody a progressive or you call somebody a right winger, whatever it is. It's, it's if, if you're right of me, then you're a fundamentalist right winger. If you're left of me, you're a raging progressive liberal, whatever, right? And it's, and it's, it's relative. And so that's oftentimes where this label is. If you're less Calvinistic than I am, then you're Pelagian because you're more Pelagian than I am. You're more like whatever they say Pelagius believed and taught, which is obviously erroneous based upon the actual facts of the matter that we've gone over here. But if you're if you're less Calvinistic than me, by the, the, the definition of the labels that that person holds to, he can, of course, call you a Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, whatever else he wants to do. And that's exactly what you see people like Tyler doing, it seems. Is, is its own thing. If you're a provisionist, you deny provenient grace. There's no, there's no special work of the Holy Spirit upon the unbeliever to change any part of their nature to make faith possible. Okay, so hopefully you hear what he's saying, and then I understand what he's meaning by that. He's trying to say the same thing Roger Olson says, too, okay? So I'm not going to come down hard on on Tyler here. 
I'm just I'm I'm just nuancing some of the statement that he's saying here because we do believe that the Holy Spirit is working on the heart of man. We do we believe he does so through the, his chosen means. This is one of the reasons we spend so much time talking about, for example, um, Hebrews chapter four, because it really does kind of illustrate what we're talking about here. The word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So what is the word of God, the spoken true word of God able to do? It's able to judge the intentions of something inwardly. It's able to break through, not bones and marrow, like a sword, an external weapon would do, an external weapon can have an internal impact, right? Well, the Word of God is the same way. It goes through our ears if it's preached or through our eyes if it's read, but it can have an internal impact. It can bring conviction to us. It can bring knowledge and revelation and understanding that we did not have before. And it, therefore, it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things open and laid bare the eyes of him we must give it an answer. And so we can say that yes, that's, that is a supernatural work of God upon the heart through the means that he has chosen, i.e. through the word, the word of God, the proclaimed truth, the inspired truth of who God is and what he has accomplished. Now, you may want to argue that the, the proclaimed truth of God's word isn't special enough or isn't supernatural enough, but you can't say that it's not at all special or at all supernatural, because that's just demonstrably untrue. It is special, and it is supernatural by definition. And therefore, that's why these these kinds of statements can get so uh, garbled, and it seems like hair-splitting, especially among those who are not the theology geeks that get into the details of this. But this is why it's so important to understand these things, is that you can't ignore the means by which the Holy Spirit is chosen to, to work, which is one of the reasons we use that illustration so often about the car, the boat, and the helicopter saving the guy from drowning and him saying, no, I don't want any of those things. God's going to save me. He dies, gets to heaven, says, God, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent you a car, a boat, and helicopter. God works through human means. And if God works through the preacher proclaiming the inspired word of God, that is special. And yes, it was brought by supernatural means, whether you want to call it that or not. I think it does. It is, by my definition, supernatural and special. The question is, is it sufficient? Is hearing the word, the truth of God's word, sufficient for the person who hears it, who is created in the Imago Dei with a conscience given to him by God, a conscience that's able now to know right from wrong, according to Romans 2, to be able to judge that which is right or wrong, and, and testify within their conscience that God has written on their hearts whether what they're saying is true or not, to accept it or to suppress it, as the Bible says we're responsible for, that the very words of God, the very words of Christ, will judge us on the final day from John 12, 48. So we're not judged by the number of sins we do. We're not judged by being born under Adam. What are we judged for? What we do with the very words of Christ, according to Jesus. And so that's where our standard is with regard to these issues and why this I think this debate is, is so significant. Faith is possible for the unbeliever in virtue of them being a human. A human created in the Imago Dei. A human created by God with a conscience. Okay, So we're not saying you as a human can go out into your woodshed and build a free will Okay, or build the capacity to understand and respond to truth. No, we're saying God in his graciousness created us with the ability to reason, to think, to deliberate, and to understand right from wrong. It's what happened in the garden, according to Genesis. Go back and read Genesis. He, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And what happens? They're cast out of the garden, which is the, the, the representative of death. You're separated now from the life giver, the, the truth. But it even says um, that they have been separated outside the garden, but they may take of the tree of life. They may reach, it even says, they may reach and take of the tree of life so that they may live. Okay, So there's still responsibility of those outside the garden to respond in faith to the revelation and the light of God who comes to them outside their garden through the gospel, through Christ, through revelation, through the prophets, through the apostles, through the scriptures. God bridges that gap, and we believe he does so sufficiently. So all the means that the Holy Spirit uses to make himself known are sufficient under provisionism. They're insufficient under the other umbrellas 
unless God does some other additional special supernatural work upon the heart, causing some kind of an ontological change of nature or something that is undefined, uh, depending on who you're talking to. And that's what we're just saying. That seems like a lot of theological baggage to us, and we don't see it as being necessary to understand the scriptures. Right. There's, there's, so the, okay. the initial step of faith, nothing special has to happen for you to have your first step of faith. Nothing special has to happen to you. So in other words, it's not special, I guess, in the mind of Tyler, for the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God, the inspiration of the story of who he is in his teachings through inspired apostles, the carrying of that message for generations through the spoken word of the preacher who proclaims it, who is filled by the Holy Spirit at the time. None of that is really special. It's just normative, okay? It's just natural, right? Well, I understand what he means by that. It's, it's, it seems normal to us, and it seems just like everyday common stance. I turn on the radio and listen to a, a spirit-filled messenger of the gospel preaching the inspired word of God. That's just normative stuff. That's just normal, everyday thing to us. And so, therefore, it's not really special. There has to be some kind of a secret, unseen, direct work upon my, my very ontological nature, changing me into something I wasn't before in order for me to respond positively to that radio message. Do you see do you see the, the difference? And so I understand what he means by saying that. I'm just pushing back on it to say, I think God's work is special, <laughs> even when it's through normative things, uh, even when he brings it about through normative ways. Uh, I still call it special and, and supernatural. I, I still think God's at work, even through those those natural means. On, on, prov on provisionism. Provisionism says that the provision was the death of Christ, that salvation was provided okay. for all or the, or the mechanism or the means for salvation was provided for all humanity that's where provision he made provision for salvation for i didn't okay so um and that's true yeah that that we do believe that the death burial and resurrection of christ is the provision the means by which um we may be saved by grace through faith and we can't be saved apart from that provision and god's not obligated to provide that for anyone even for believers and so uh it is all of god's grace it's nothing that we earn or merit um believing in in christ doesn't merit the salvation that we have from christ um and that that's something we have to continually emphasize for obvious reasons so hopefully that kind of sets up what we're going to talk about today as we move from the calvinist side of the representation of provisionists to the Arminian side uh, from our friend, Dr. Roger Olson. And uh, let me put this into the screen because I think this will help us. You'll, you, if you can go back, you can watch the video. This link is in the show notes uh, for the article for uh, Roger, and you can go back and listen to, to my uh, conversation with, with Dr. Olson. He's a great, humble man. Uh, met him before there at, at Truett. Um, I, I have a great admiration for him, and I, I enjoyed our conversation as he he reflects as well, and so I appreciate that a lot. Um, and, and I write this here in this article just so you can kind of get some background for this. Um, doc, Dr. Olson is a scholar I've admired from afar for quite some time, and I felt our conversation was very fruitful despite some of our differences. Many of you who follow the blog and podcast are aware that I've taken issue with some of Dr. Olson's views regarding mankind's innate moral inability. So this is the issue right here that we're contending with classical Arminians, is that Arminius, having been raised in Geneva under Calvin's teaching, we believe he adopted the Augustinian slash Calvinistic concepts of innate moral inability due to the fall. In other words, because of whatever happened in the fall, we're not only cast out of the garden, but we're cast out of the garden in such a way that we cannot reach out and take of the tree of life unless he does ontologically some work of grace upon us. In other words, some kind of ontological change of the very nature of who we are as fallen beings. Okay, And uh, and so that I'm contending with that. I, I don't see any evidence that Cain and Abel, for example, did, lost their innate moral ability to respond to uh to God's gracious provision through the sacrifice. In other words, Cain and Abel were both able to bring the right sacrifice. The fact that one of them did and one of them didn't demonstrates that freedom of, of the capacity of them to bring the right sacrifice, uh, uh, which, of course, the right sacrifice is one brought in faith. 
And I think, based upon the evidence of the scripture passage, that Cain uh, did not bring a, the right sacrifice because he did not act in faith, whereas Abel did. And thus it was pleasing to the father, whereas uh, Cain's was not. Um, and so there's nothing that I can see within the original uh, fall uh, narrative or in any place with, throughout scripture that there's some kind of innate moral inability. Now, r- obviously Dr. Olson has reasons for adopting this worldview, most of which you'll see later rest upon his his understanding of John chapter 6, verse 44. But we may get into that a little bit later. We've talked about that in other episodes quite extensively. But I, I have issues with mankind's, uh, his, his view of mankind's innate moral inability due to the fall and subsequent need of prevenient grace to repair it, which you can read about more uh, there at that article if you're interested. In his most recent blog article, which we'll go to here in a little bit, um, but I, I wanna, want you to see kind of where I'm coming from first. Dr. Olson, without mentioning my name, cordially addresses our conversation and outlined the gist of our disagreement in this manner. Here's a quote from Roger Olson. Here's the gist of the issue that keeps coming up in these conversations. I argue that Arminius himself and all faithful classical historical Arminians, among which I count myself, believe that a prevenient grace enabling, assisting grace that goes before conversion, making it possible, is supernatural and a special work of the Holy Spirit, freeing the will of the sinner, which is otherwise bound to sin, unbelief. I have presented the alternatives as Calvinism's irresistible grace and semi-Pelagianism, the initiative in salvation is human. Now, he'll get to that in a minute with regard to if provisionism fits that definition. So hang on for his answer, because I think you'll like it if you're a provisionist, because he's pretty fair here. First, I write, we all agree the initiative in salvation is God's. So everybody catch that. So you theology geeks, you're really trying to, you're, you, those of you who are watching this, um, I, I want you to understand our position. Even if you're a Calvinist, you may not agree with this. I just want you to get what provisionism is. Okay, that, that's my goal here. Um, we, we, and God is the initiator not man. The question is, what are the means by which God initiates, right? And are they sufficient? Okay. That's, that's the bigger issue, not whether he's the initiator or not, but how he initiates and are the means that he chooses to initiate sufficient? Are the car, the boat, and the helicopter actually sufficient means by which the person can be saved by the flood or not? Or does there need to be some supernatural something that happens that causes the person to want to accept the, the car, the boat, and the helicopter? Uh, and that's that's where we would disagree. So I write, we disagree as to the means and the sufficiency of God's initiative. Okay, So the means, i.e. the proclamation of the gospel by Holy Spirit-inspired authors, okay, are they sufficient? In other words, are they enough for a person to be able to respond willingly or positively to those means? Yes or no? That's the big debate. So none of us meet Dr. Olson's definition of semi-Pelagianism, which, by the way, he actually agrees with, as you'll see here in a little bit. Second, the term prevenient grace probably needs to be defined in more specific terms so as to draw out the distinction between us, because I would argue that the gracious gospel, along with all of God's self-revelatory means, would be considered enabling, okay, and assisting grace that goes before conversion. I would also consider anything that the Holy Spirit does to ensure these means are brought to pass a supernatural and special work of the Holy Spirit. So this is the same thing I was arguing against Tyler, is that he keeps, he keeps using the word supernatural and special in the exact same way that Roger Olson does. But I would also say that what we believe that God has done is supernatural, and yes, we would even call it special. But it, in other words, it's super supernatural. It's super special. Okay. So it's, it's above and beyond the already supernatural special work he did in inspiring the gospel and bringing the cross uh, to fruition and all that we know about what's happened in the Bible. That's supernatural and special, but there needs to be an extra supernatural, extra special work that causes now the very ontological nature of man to change so that they can believe that supernatural and special work. Make, making sense. Okay. I hoping, just hoping you understand it. Okay. I go on, inspiring, preserving, and dispersing the gospel throughout the world by the Holy Spirit and dwelled bride of Christ is a supernatural and special work of the Holy Spirit, is it not? 
If it is, then the burden is on Dr. Olson and other Arminians, and Calvinists for that matter, to demonstrate that that work in and of itself is insufficient to accomplish the purpose for which the Bible says itself says it was sent to accomplish, as we see in John 20, 31. This is the verse we quote quite regularly, saying, these things were written, speaking about the truth of the gospel and all of the work of Christ. These things were written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. So it's by hearing and understanding and, and seeing these things that you may believe it. How will they believe without a preacher implies that with a preacher they may believe. That's the implication of that question. And there has to be, I think, a clear didactic text that teaches that mankind can't but by nature, but by the way in which they were created with a conscience, really understand divinely wrought truth. And I think that's a high, high burden for, for both Calvinists and classical Arminians to, to, uh, to defend. I write this, and the Arminian must show us in Scripture not merely the historical writings of Arminius, where it plainly says that an extra or additional supernatural, supernatural special work of grace must accompany and or precede the gracious revelation of the gospel appeal and other means that, that God may use. I write this, some argue that the gospel is not sufficient to enable the lost to believe without a work of the Holy Spirit. I argue the gospel is always sufficient to enable the lost to believe because it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Now let that, that quote just sink in for a moment and try to understand where we're coming from here. Okay, Some argue that the, that the work of the, the, the gospel being proclaimed and the work of the Holy Spirit are kind of like two totally separate things. And so the work of the gospel is one thing, and then the work of the Holy Spirit is another thing, and therefore the work of the Holy Spirit has to somehow accomplish or has to somehow accompany the work of the gospel in order to make it a sufficient work. And what, what I'm saying is, no, the work of the gospel itself is a work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is sufficient by definition of it being from the Spirit. Okay, And therefore, whatever the, procl the proclamation of the gospel accomplishes, who do I give credit for its, its work to? The one who wrote it. Okay even though he might have done it through human means, like a prophet like Isaiah or a apostle like Paul, I still give credit ultimately to the Holy Spirit, even though he may have used a human means by which to proclaim that truth. Does that make sense? All right. Dr. Olson, Olson speaks of a special work of the Holy Spirit, freeing the will of the sinner, which is otherwise bound to sin and unbelief. Notice his presumption that bondage to sin is equal to, to being unable to believe in God. Okay? Now notice that that's the same presumption, by the way, that Calvinists think. If I'm in bondage to sin, therefore I can't believe in the one who came to set me free from my bondage. And that is a non sequitur. Know what a non sequitur is? You can look it up on Google. It's when you are, are, are ultimately what a non sequitur is, is when your conclusion is not based or it does not flow from the argument. And it doesn't flow to say that someone's in bondage to something, therefore makes them incapable of confessing their bondage and accepting the help of the one who has come to free them. And that's exactly what Olson seems to be doing, at least initially in this article. So notice his presumption that bondage to sin is equal to being unable to believe in God. But where is that established in the Bible? It seems to me that Scripture calls those bound to sin to humbly confess their bondage in faith so as to be set free not the other way around. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, for example, says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. James 4, 11, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. 2 Kings twenty two nineteen. 19, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I've spoken against this place and its people that they would become a curse and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have also heard you, declares the Lord. So why did he hear them? Because their heart was responsive, because they humbled themselves. Okay, So the, I think the natural reading of that text is that you're responsible to humble yourself even though you're in bondage to sin. Um, so being in bondage to sin does not preclude the ability to humble yourself and confess your bondage in light of the word of God. That, that's the point here. And there are many other verses that we've gone through many other times. So just for time's sake, I'll, I'll jump to uh, Dr. Olson's co uh, comments here. Dr. Olson says, apparently, from what I have been able to detect and understand, the traditional Baptist, the provisionist view is that the gospel itself naturally, so notice this, the gospel itself naturally 
without any supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Catch that. So the gospel, naturally, without an additional, what he should say is without any additional work of the Holy Spirit, is all that the sinner needs to respond freely and positively and be converted. It seems to me that this view of prevenient grace is only the gospel communicated, is insufficient to ward off semi-Pelagianism. I'm not going to label it, and I notice what he says here, and he gets more clear later in the comments. I'm not going to label it as semi-Pelagian, but I worry that it's too close for comfort. Okay, And again, we're going to get more in detail on that in here in a little bit. I write this. First, I should note that even among traditional Baptists, provisionists like myself, there are those who would side with Dr. Olson on this point. I do not speak for all traditional Southern Baptists, just as Dr. Olson does not claim to speak for all within his tribe. Second, he says the gospel itself naturally, without any supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, is all that the sinner needs to respond freely and positively to be converted. Notice the presumption of that statement. Dr. Olson seems to assume the gospel itself cannot be considered a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the problem? He seems to be, I know he doesn't mean that, but what he, what he, his words are not clear enough to distinguish our points of contention because we would argue that yes, the gospel itself and the proclaiming of that gospel and the dispersion of that gospel is yes, a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible seems to indicate that that's the case, as we already read from Hebrews 4.12. And I won't read that again just for time's sake. This penetrating work into the soul and spirit sounds like the work of prevenient grace described by my Arminian brethren. Yet the author of Hebrews simply refers to it as the word of God, as accomplishing this work, not some extra working of grace that aids the otherwise incapacitated nature of fallen man. Do God's gracious means really need more grace to work? needs to be a little bit more special, a little bit more supernatural in order for it to actually have the effect it's intended to have. Here are some other passages that seem to teach that the scriptures um, that God, God's inspired words are indeed sufficient even for the lost. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, for example, you have known the scriptures, the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. Now notice they're called the holy scriptures. Why? Because that's, that's special. <laughs> these, these words that are written on the page, they're holy, they're sacred, they're special. They're supernaturally wrought, okay? So the Holy Spirit wrought scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. That's, that's why it's supernatural. It's special because it's breathed by God. And it's useful because of that for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, which wouldn't, which wouldn't make much sense if you're born unable to understand, accept, and receive the rebuking, correcting, and training because of a nature you were born with, by divine decree, mind you, because it's not by accident that the fall caused humanity to lose this capacity, is it? That, that's one of the things you've got to kind of consider in this whole issue, is that you've got to ultimately believe that even on Roger Olson's view, that God permitted, if nothing else, for the call to the, call, the fall to cause everyone from that point forward to be incapable, morally speaking, to respond to the inspired word of God only to give that ability back to everyone at some point in time in some supernatural, undefined, secret way. And that's why we're saying, where is that in the Bible? That seems like a lot of theological baggage just added there because of the, I think, the acceptance of the Augustinian model of, of original sin, which is what we're pushing back on. Romans ten seventeen. Consequently, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the preached word of Christ. So here's, here's an explanation by the inspired word of God telling us how faith comes. Kate, faith comes from what is heard. That sounds like it's, you're hearing it with your ears, right? And someone said, well, some people can't hear. That's why the Bible says, he who has ears, let him hear. Some people can't hear. But why can't they hear according to the text? If you go to every single time that the context uh, of those kinds of verses is being used, you will notice that he's talking about people like the hardened Israelites who have closed their ears for so long that now they've grown hardened and calloused and can't hear anymore. Anybody who plugs their ears long enough, eventually the, the, the truth is taken from them. And that's their own fault, not a natural condition from birth. In other words, they're not born morally blinded because that would, uh, that would give them the very best excuse they could possibly have for not seeing the light. They become blinded to the light when they close their eyes. Like Acts 28 says, Paul preaching to them all day long. Some are convinced, 
Some would not believe, and he rebukes those who would not believe by telling them, your heart has grown calloused. You have closed your eyes. Otherwise, you might see, hear, understand, and believe, and I would heal you. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles. What's he saying? You have closed your eyes. You have closed your ears. That's your fault. And that's why he's saying, everyone who has ears, let him hear. He's not saying everyone who's elected before the foundation of the world and irresistibly caused to hear, let him hear. He's saying, everyone who has not closed your ears, everyone who is still willing to listen, hear and learn so that you may be saved. So faith comes by what is heard. And how does one hear? Through the preached word of Christ. That's exactly what Paul says. So the preached word of Christ is supernatural, it's special, and it's necessary. For how will they believe in one whom they've not heard? which implies if they do hear and they're not closing their ears, then they may respond positively to that message. Um, also, you see this in John 6, 63. The words that I've spoken to you, the very words that I've preached to you will be your judge in the final day, John 12, 48. They are full of spirit and life. So he equates the very words that he is speaking out of his lips as full of spirit and life. The early church fathers seem to likewise under, have this understanding, and there's some quotes there, but just for time's sake, I'm going to kind of move on. Olson continues, it seems to me that the Bible does teach that the sinner is capable of responding to the offer of saving grace with repentance and faith without a supernatural work. And again, what do you mean by that? Supernatural work of God, the Holy Spirit enables, enabling him or her to do that. Dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2 seem to imply that. Okay, So what is he doing? He's using the dead argument like Calvinists do. Dead means morally, moral incapability. Uh, and so you're born with a moral incapacity because you're born dead, interpreting, I think, dead wrongly. Instead of dead like in the garden, you're cast out of the garden. You're like the prodigal son. You're distant. You're in the far country. Therefore, you must draw near. You're made alive by reconciliation. They, he interprets dead more literally as to being you're morally born morally incapable of responding unless God gives you some form of life so that you can respond, which is why I think Roger Olson argues for what he calls a partial regeneration which to me I think is is far from what Scripture ever teaches with regard to these things. Susan Thorpe, thank you for uh, your, your kind super chat. Um, she writes this, I know the body of Christ by 2023 will finally understand salvation. No longer need to debate. It's only been 2,000 years, LOL. Yeah, sometimes it seems like, why, why is there so much controversy? Well, free will is the answer to that question. We, we have the freedom to make mistakes. Uh, otherwise, we have God decreeing our mistakes, which is, is uh, silly uh, sounding to me. Again, the inspiration I write and sending of the gospel itself is set up as being something other than supernatural work of God. And I'm simply asking, is that a biblical idea or one created by a faulty theological system introduced by Augustine and propagated by Calvin in Geneva? Also in our discussion, I did address the idiomatic use of deadness in the scriptures and have yet to seen any indication that the biblical authors mean to suggest an innate moral incapacity to respond to God's life-giving truth. That is discussed more in depth in another article link there. Dr. Olson finally makes this important, asks this important question. How important is this difference? Is it a distinction without a difference? Are both really Arminians? Is the Arminian umbrella large enough to shelter both classical Arminians who follow Arminius himself about supernatural prevenient grace and our non-Calvinist traditional Southern Baptists like, uh, like I am, uh, provisionist in other words? Sometimes it seems to me that if, if two Christians who seem to agree about something talk long enough, they will inevitably find that they disagree about it on some point, however minor. But is this a minor point? I have to admit that sometimes it seems to me that it is, and other times it may seem major. Uh, and I write this. In my conversation with Dr. Olson, it certainly seemed that I consider the distinction more significant than he did, with all due respect, as he did not seem to want to get into the weeds, quote unquote, which is understandable. But the reason I have written and spoken about our differences a number of times is that I do believe it is a point worthy of consideration, whereas the Arminians I've encountered thus far seem to want to play down the differences or sometimes even pretend they're unimportant. I'm happy to hear that Dr. Olson would like to further explore the importance of this distinction. I could be mistaken, but it seemed to me that Dr. Olson's views on this issue were more driven by tactical and historical motivations rather than biblical ones. And I'm not trying to say that he's not concerned about biblical distinctions, okay? What I'm saying is that in his discussion with me, he seemed to be more concerned about the tactical and historical motivations. 
when I would bring up the scriptural arguments, he would either appeal to the necessity of avoiding the Calvinistic boogeyman label of semi-Pelagianism. He doesn't want to be accused like Tyler Vela accused us of being semi-Pelagian, says, I have to do whatever I can to avoid that label, right? Um, and so they want to avoid that label of semi-Pelagianism or the historical teaching of Arminius himself, either of which, neither of which have much influence on me. In other words, I really don't care all that much about what Arminius said on the matter or what you know, the Council of Orange or some other <laughs> council led by people who had very erroneous beliefs from what we what we hold to uh, said on this topic. That's not really my authority. While there's value in understanding the historical debates over these matters, I consider it a weakness to allow the leftover baggage of 16th century debates to keep us from seeking the original intention of the biblical authors in their first century context. I suspect that Dr. Olson would agree with me in principle on this point. But will he demonstrate that by addressing our differences exegetically rather than just historically? I hope so, I write. Now, let's go with that in mind to the article. Uh, this, that, this is the article that I'm responding to. And I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you again. But this is where the article is found if you're interested. And there's a link in the show notes if you want to go look at it because I, I don't want to be unfair to Dr. Olson. Please go read it in its full context. Um, but what I found interesting is the comment section here at the bottom. Let me pull that up. In this section, there are dozens, if not <laughs> hundreds, of back and forth conversations. And this is, this is really gonna get into the weeds. Um, Rutchen here, I guess that's how you pronounce that, or raw, uh, R. Hutchin, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, he, he I, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure of his name, but he comments a lot on our blog articles too. And, uh, and he, he kind of starts off this conversation down in the, the quotes in the, in the chat. He says, Dr. Olson writes, prevenient grace, enabling assisting grace that goes before conversion, makes it poss making it possible, is supernatural and a special work of the Holy Spirit, freeing the will of the sinner, which is otherwise bound to sin and unbelief. And he asks this, he says, what do you mean by freeing the will of the sinner, which is otherwise bound to sin and unbelief? Prevenient grace would seem to have to deal with the spiritual deadness of the person without which no action on the will could accomplish anything. Thus you say the Bible does, does teach that the sinner is incapable of willfully responding to the offer of saving grace with repentance and faith without a supernatural work of God, the Holy Spirit enable him or her to do that. Dead in trespasses and sins seems to go further. Ephesians 2 has those dead in sin indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, suggesting that the will is active, but under the influence of a spirit. In your latter comments, you seem to agree on this. To me, total depravity is simply a phrase to describe what I see in Scripture as a teaching that due to the full, we are all helpless to do anything truly spiritually good toward our salvation without a special aid from God. I believe the traditionalists or provisionists has the gospel affecting freedom from slavery to sin apart from any work of the Holy Spirit. And so um, so he, he seems to be kind of defending the same thing. He says, I'm still confused about the role of the Holy Spirit in the traditionalist Baptist non-Calvinistic Arminian soteriology. I would like them and its proponents to explain the role more specifically. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to get on here to say this. We do believe the Holy Spirit works. We believe he works through means. And we believe those means are sufficient. Now, does that mean to say that that the Holy Spirit doesn't work through any other special means or secret internal means? He could, yes. That, that That's never been something we have said he couldn't or doesn't do. We know he certainly works inwardly in the Christian's life. Uh, the inner life of the Holy Spirit working to bring conviction to me and to speak with me is obviously an internal, you, albeit secret, uh, working of the Spirit. So there's definitely that. But the question is more specifically, is there some kind of inward, internal working of the Spirit that ontologically changes the very nature of the being, giving the human back a quality that he lost in the fall? That's really the point of contention. And I, I don't find that established anywhere in, in the Bible. Okay, so there, there's several points here. And I, I, I kind of, let me go down to yeah, I think Eric here. Um, yeah, Eric is a class. I think Eric uh, Langstrom here is a, a classical Armenian, and uh, and notice what he says. He 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 quotes from Olson saying, "I'm not going to label it as semi-Pelagianism. That was kind, Roger. 
I call it semi-Pelagianism because that's what the definition of semi-Pelagianism is. In other words, even though he's an Arminian, he's saying the exact same thing that Tyler said. Okay, And so both a Calvinist and an Arminian are agreeing, hey, that, that provisionism, that stuff, that traditional stuff, that is just semi-Pelagianism by definition, despite the fact that the definitions we provided from actual sources, uh, non-bias sources, in fact, say just the opposite of that. But nevertheless, you've got guys like Eric out there. You've got guys like Tyler out there that are just insistent. That is semi-Pelagianism, no matter what you say. Um, so that's the point he's making. And he, he says some other stuff here, and I'm, I'm not trying to read it all because my, my voice will go out before I read all this. But notice what Roger says, and I, and I appreciate Roger for these kinds of comments. He says, the reason I declined to call it semi-Pelagian is because of the emphasis on the gospel communicated as the initiative. So he's getting it here. He's saying, I don't want to call it semi-Pelagianism because they do have a form of prevenient grace, revelatory grace. It's necessary, and it must be initiated by him. They do not say that man can alone, apart from hearing the gospel, reach out to God and find God. It may seem like a slight difference, but I think it matters. So I think Roger is, is being fair there. Um, and then Eric replies, he says, I hear what you're saying, but Leighton insists that it's not necessary for the Spirit to be present. Now notice his language change here. The Spirit just has to, doesn't have to be present. Well, I've explained to Eric and others on the Society of Evangelical Armenians and other places. The Spirit is present everywhere. He's omnipresent. So to talk about his presence isn't a point of distinction. We're talking about what he's doing and the means he's accomplishing. So is the Spirit present when the car, the boat, and the helicopter show up? Of course. That doesn't mean that the Spirit's not working through the means of the car, the boat, and the helicopter in a sufficient way. But what do you mean by the presence of the Spirit? The presence of the Spirit does not answer the point of contention as to whether there has to be some kind of ontological change of the nature done by the present spirit to cause people to have the capacity they once lost. And so with all due respect to Eric, he's just missing our actual point of, of distinction. Okay, um, moving on down here, I mark down which ones I wanted. Well, D Dana Steele makes a good point here. She says the, the and I assume Dana is a female, I'm not sure for, for which, it probably could be either. Um, the traditionalist seems to say that we are born with the ability to believe, because believing itself is not a work that requires supernatural ability. The gospel brings light so that we can understand and that the power to save us if we submit. How is that different from the Wesleyan view of universal provenient grace? Now, I wanted to get this in, because if you listen to my interview with Matt Pinson, which again, good for theology geeks to get into, especially our Armenian theology geeks, if you really want to go into the depths of this, because he's asking the very question that I asked Matthew Pinson, is how is this significantly different than what Wesleyan argued for? And many people are happily accepting Wesleyans as a part of the, under the umbra, uh, umbrella of Orthodox Arminianism and not a semi-heretical doctrine of some sort. And she has some more questions there, but that's basically the question she's asking about. How does this compare to Wesleyan's view of, of uh, this view of prevenient grace? And Roger Olson says this, exactly what I've preached here, much to the dismay of many. As for Wesley, I've often wondered what he would have thought of Rayner's supernatural ex ex existential. I think his version of prevenient grace was somewhat similar, a universal but supernatural gift enabling everyone to ex receive and accept the gospel, offer free grace with faith. And so what he's pointing out is what we've talked about before, is that under Wesleyan's view, what he, he argues is that when Christ died the, on the cross, that he took upon that sin nature. And universally, everyone from that point on got back the ability that they lost somehow. Again, I don't see that as a necessary issue, but for all practical purposes, everyone is born with the ability to respond to the gospel. And therefore, you'll see quotes from Wesley talking about the revelatory work of prevenient grace in the sense that God works through means to bring his light and his truth. And people, because of the work of the cross, can respond to it now positively. And so that, that's what he's referring to. Um, just skipping through some of these just for time's sake, but Martin Glenn makes a comment here. I have to agree with your basic assessment. I don't think that traditionalist Baptists are semi-Pelagian, but I do think they have stepped outside of the Armenian umbrella. So notice what Martin Glenn is saying here. 
I, I don't think they're semi-Pelagian, but I don't think they're quite Arminian. Right. Okay. I would agree with this, basically, what Martin is saying. And the main reason that I find is that they are uncomfortable with the Calvinist articulation of depravity. When I have dialogued with them, it seems that the reason why they cannot embrace traditional Arminian theology is precisely because our view of depravity seems too close to the Calvinist. Exactly. You're exactly right, Martin. To that, all I can say is that when you run from error, you are still you are still controlled by it. Run to truth, and if error gets a couple of things right, so be it. So, yeah, I understand your point. You, you don't reject total inability just because the Calvinist holds to it and you don't like Calvinists. I agree with some things that Calvinists say, as many of you know. So you don't, you don't reject total inability because the Calvinist accepts it. You, you reject it because it's not biblical, is basically the argument. And that's exactly why we reject it. But we also think that the reason it was adopted in the first place is because of the influence of Augustinianism and Calvinism uh, on even people like uh, uh, Jacob as Arminius. All right, moving on down. Um, uh, I'm just trying to skip through some of these. Not going to get into all of that. Okay, Jack Lyons is one I wrote down here. Okay. Uh, Jack writes, I look forward to your blogs. The story of Christian theology remains one of my valued resources. Um, he says, um, Eastern Orthodoxy, on the other hand, has redefined my systematic background. It's not feasible to look at the image in which we're created as being infected rather than being totally depraved and whereby receptive at times to the gospel message. Um, yes, of course, we're receptive. Okay, that's not the one I was wanting to see there. I think I missed it. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of looking through. There's a bunch of comments here. Um, I'm just making sure I hit them. Okay, let me go, let me go to this one. James writes this: Is it is it possible that the whole prevenient grace versus Calvin's version, and even the reformed definition of total depravity, are a product of their cultural time, and have a faulty foundation, similar to the way the new perspective has changed the foundation of understanding of justification? I am thinking of, for example, the King. Jesus Gospel of McKnight. Where does total depravity fit into that frame? Roger Olson replies, I don't know if I can speak to McKnight about that. To me, total depravity is simply a phrase to describe what I see in Scripture as the teaching that due to the fall, we are all helpless to do anything truly spiritually good toward our salvation without the special aid from God. And that's where I would push out back. I think the gospel is a special aid from God, and it's a sufficient special aid for God. And without it, yes, we would be helpless to do anything. But I wouldn't call responding to the gospel uh, positively a truly spiritual good that's toward our salvation because I don't conflate that kind of righteousness with the kind of righteousness that Christ said we don't have. No one is righteous with accordance with the law doesn't mean no one can believe in Christ uh, and his righteousness. And I think that's a conflation that sometimes Calvinists make as well. Um, right, moving on down here. I think I want to go to, there's a, a quote here. Sorry. I'm going to just scroll through some of these. You can see this is the weeds right here. Yeah, Stephen makes a comment I wanted to, to read. It says, um, not believing in pervenient grace makes it difficult to understand the verses that talk about drawing people and Christ being a light to the whole world. Unless these ideas are interpreted as God via the natural presentation of the gospel draws people. Exactly. Uh, that's exactly what we do. <laughs> God via the car, the boat, and the helicopter. God via the proclamation of the word of God. God via the prophets, the priests, the 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 apostles. Uh, yes, uh, that that is exactly what we're saying, uh, and Christ Himself exactly. Um, Christ via the natural presentation of the gospel uh, is a light to the whole world. But I think there are enough instances of people being drawn toward a presentation of the gospel, meaning the Holy Spirit drew them before they'd even heard, or people who were saved outside of the gospel presentation to make a more compelling case for prevenient grace. Again, we're not denying Stephen that God has other compelling means of revelation. That's what we talk about with Romans 1, for example, that God through natural revelation. The difference is, is that we believe that natural revelation is actually sufficient for somebody to respond to it. Now, some people say, oh, you believe then, therefore, natural revelation can save people? No, revelation doesn't save people. Whether special 
uh, whether specific or rather general, whether uh, c- through creation, whatever. Revelation reveals. That's what Revelation does. And it reveals sufficiently so that a person who sees it may respond to it. And if you suppress it, that's your fault, not a nature you were born with that you couldn't help it. That, that's the, the point we're making. Um, all right, so I was going to move on down here. Um, Ammonite has some good stuff to say. Um what does it mean to be dead in sin? Um, and he, 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 Ammonite, he or her goes uh, goes really into detail of really defending the concept of being dead in, in, in sin or being dead in the scripture as not meaning inability, uh, like Olson seems to to assume. Um, and and Ro- Roger responds and says, of course, even from the moderate Calvinist perspective, it looks like works righteousness. This would seem to make a the man's decision of faith the decisive factor in salvation. Well, as I said, from even a moderate Calvinist perspective, I'm not sure Arminians need to get worked up about this, but I'm not sure whether this view can be called Arminian. In other words, I don't know that Arminians need to get so concerned about that particular nuance, difference, um, but I don't know that it can be called what Arminian believed, in other words. Um, And and Ammonite makes a good point that Calvinists seem to interpret a lot of things to be work-based that really aren't. And I, I would totally agree with that. Um, Ammonite also writes this, um, what is semi-Pelagianism? And then he goes through and gives definitions of what semi-Pelagianism re- actually is. Uh, for example, the beginning of faith can be accomplished by human will alone, unaided by grace. Would any of us say that as provisionists? No, because we have to be aided by the revelatory grace of the gospel and the truth by which he brings it. The spirit must act first. So it can't be accomplished by our will alone, uh, and we need his aid. So we would absolutely de- deny that, which uh, Emmerite points out. Roger Olson replies, I regard semi-Pelagianism, notice what it says, I regard semi-Pelagianism as semi-Augustinianism. Cassian and the others who are lumped together with him in the original semi-Pelagians consider themselves followers of Augustine, but disagreed with him about uh, especially predestination. In other words, he even goes on to say, it's, it's, sometimes it's referred to more as semi-Augustinianism, really because Cassian actually argued for some of what Augustinians believed. Uh, so you could actually uh, categorize it as semi-Augustinian, uh, and that's exactly what Amorite points out here. Calling it semi-Augustinian would be equally viable. Um, don't d- disagree with that with that point. Um, they go back and forth talking about this. Um, Ammonite actually writes this too. What a great topic. I consider myself a staunch non-Calvinist, but do not label myself in an Arminian primarily due to the issue of prevenient grace and the underlying assumptions it seems to hold. In other words, Ammonite seems like a provisionist here writing on this topic, and I appreciate um, them jumping on here to do this. I can I endeavor to lay out where I think the true definitions or differences in definition or philosophy lie. The crucial one seems to be on what it means to initiate salvation. It's exactly right. What does it mean to initiate salvation? That not holding to Calvinism or Arminian, or Arminianism is somehow equivalent to semi-Pelagianism. It's a false dilemma. And what it means to be dead in sin, I'll have to respond to each separately. And then it goes on to talk about what does it mean to initiate, which is makes some great points. Responding to the gospel in faith equivalent to initiating salvation. Okay. In other words, if, the, if God works to bring you the light, the truth of the gospel, is that considered initiation or not? I would say yes, and I, w- I would think anybody being objective would say absolutely. That is what the initiative is. It is his uh, initiative. Um, and then and then he goes on to talk more about the deadness and those kinds of things as well. And then I actually comment under that uh, that I appreciate. This is back three years ago, by the way. I comment under there that I really appreciate uh, Ammonite's writing. Um, this is my husband and I. So it is a female. So uh, my husband and I follow you but, and Roger Olson. And so it's she who's writing Ammonite is writing. Well, um, I'm got, there's some more here that I really wanted you to see, so I'm going to keep going just a little bit further. Uh, Albert Williams. Um, I did write in there about the article that I wrote, linked to that. Albert Williams writes this, Perhaps both Calvin and Arminius and others over-literalize the meaning of dead in trespasses and sins. Amen to that. And also make the expression imply more than it actually says. I offer two pieces of evidence for consideration. First, the prodigal son is described in Luke 15, 24, as we've already mentioned. 
Ezekiel 18 seems to imply that anybody can repent and turn and live. Once a person does that, um, they will be given a new heart and new spirit, um, which you can see Ezekiel 18, 31, by the way. Um, I used to be a Calvinist, and then I thought I was an Arminian, but now I'm more comfortable describing myself as a pre-Augustinian in my theology, though I have a lot of work to do exploring the apostolic and post-apostolic teaching. And so this person seems to be standing, uh, Albert seems to be standing more in line with provisionism than with, uh, than with uh, the Arminian perspective. Um, L.L.R. Miller writes, I very much appreciate your interaction with flowers because it's the first one I have read that represented him fairly. Thank you. That, that, that's exactly why I pointed this out is because uh, Olson, say what you will about him, he's, he's not contentious, he's not mean about this, he's having an honest conversation about our differences and why they're important. And I, I like that. He says, I've lost a great deal of respect for academics that deride pastors who are trying to shepherd flocks in a tumultuous time as they engage terrible logical fallacies and even laypersons can detect. I also appreciate your book on Calvinism. While I do think Baptists do not pay attention as they should to the work of the Holy Spirit, I think we make the Holy Spirit too small if we do not believe he is intimately involved in the writing and protecting of his word and he also empowers those who bring it. Thank you. Thank you. I love, that's, I'm going to highlight that quote. I need to copy it. Thank you, L.L.R. Miller, whoever you are and wherever you are, if you ever see this. We do make the Holy Spirit too small if we don't believe he is the one intimately involved in the writing, the protecting, the distributing of his word through his holy inspired uh, holy uh, uh, indwelled believers, the bride of Christ. I mean, that is a work of the Holy Spirit. He can act as he wills, but does he have to do this mechanically working of the will with everyone? I don't think so. I think once Calvin's interpretation of Romans 9, John 6, and Ephesians 1 and 2 are off, in other words, once you interpret them like the provisionist does, then Calvinism as well as the Arminianism, Arminianism are gone as far as this, this particular point of Arminianism. And I would agree with that. For me, I just recall Peter there on the day of Pentecost telling frightened and horrified multitude that even though they had royally misread all of their sacred text and then crucified Jesus, all that was needed for them to repent and believe. Amazing, amazing forgiveness and reconciliation. The people that understood, that understand the most don't paint all individual people to look like depraved wretches. And he goes on. Roger replies, I have always taught that semi-Pelagianism is defined by the human initiative in salvation. Here it is right here. I have always taught that semi-Pelagianism is defined by the human initiative in salvation. Dr. Flowers certainly does, is not doing that. So I will not call him or those who believe like him semi-Pelagians. There it is. Okay, so I will even put that um, at the bottom of the screen so that everyone can see it. There is his quote. I typed it out beforehand because I wanted you to see that after all of this, this discussion, that he ultimately comes back to say, I've always taught that semi-Pelagianism is defined by the human initiative in salvation. Dr. Flowers is certainly not doing that. So I will not call him or those who believe like him semi-Pelagians. And so Olson even seems to come to the conclusion that while he was uncomfortable with us, I'm not going to label them semi-Pelagian because of this distinctive something that many people aren't willing to recognize. I appreciate that about Dr. Olson. I think that's that's very kind of him and shows him as an objective scholar. Uh, he goes he says he goes on to say what concerns me is that the view may be taken advantage of by Calvinists in the ongoing debate. This is what I was talking about his tactical concern, okay? So he's concerned about people like Tyler using the boogeyman label semi-Pelagian as taking advantage of of us that way. But he says, I'm still mulling it over. Okay. Now, if you want to argue over tactical things, I'd be glad to go there with you. Because tactically, I think I am in a very, very advantageous spot compared to the classical Arminian on this point. Because the classical Arminian has to defend this so-called partial regeneration of prevenient grace, which I think is very, very high bar for them to set. It also removes, in my estimation, the whole argument that you've heard us make over and over and over and over again about the hardening of Israel. 
that the reason they're blind is not because of a natural condition for birth, like this, the classical Arminian affirms, but because they have closed their eyes and have hardened their hearts willfully over time. In other words, the blind condition of the morally incapable are those who are self-imposed, not those who are imposed naturally from birth due to God's permission and or decree. And so I think we have a stronger tactical ground to stand on. Not only is it biblical, which is the most important, but I think our, our tactical ground against Calvinists is better suited. Um, and, and obviously it would be, obviously if it's, it's biblically true, it would be the better tactical place to be regardless. Um, <laughs> okay, so I, I'm looking at some of your, uh, your comments there, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull that off of there because um, just for, for being able to see what we're saying. I'm convinced, however, that true historical classical Arminianism holds to the necessity of a supernatural enablement by the Holy Spirit for anyone can be regenerated. So notice his two points here. He's concerned that the tactical advantage will be taken by the Calvinist, and he's, he's, he's trying to say classical Arminianism does hold to this supernatural enablement, this ontological change of nature, this partial regeneration. And he's probably right about that. He probably are right about saying Arminius believe this, classical Arminians believe this, and he's he's saying, and I think that that's true. Classical historical Arminians did believe this. I think they were wrong about that, but it doesn't change the fact that that's what they believed. And I, I he I, he also argues that it's tactically a better place to be. I would disagree with that for obvious reasons. One, because I don't think it's biblical, and two, because I, I think it removes uh, some good arguments about that. And so he there's uh, Miller is actually promoting what we talked about about the stuff that Augustine uh, introduced. That, that is uh, interesting. Kenny uh, Bardu makes some good comments here as well. Um, but just for my voice's sake, it's starting to go. I'm, I'm reading too much here. Um, is that uh, I, I, won't, I won't go through all of that, but there's some good stuff here. Um, oh, there's a couple more that I did want to jump in here, though, that were really good. Um, uh, I, I, like I said, there's a link in the show notes if you want to go read through all of this for you theology geeks who really like to get into it. Um, oh, oh yeah, this this one right here from uh, Ashwin was really good. And we'll have to end with this one because my, my throat really is going. Um, my voice is, is starting to wane here. I can feel it. And I haven't got to any questions yet on the side chat. Forgive me. Um. Yeah, I think a lot of back and forth discussion, but I don't see any direct questions, at least right now. Um, we can get to that. Ashwin writes this. I just had to look at the interview. I think the issue can be addressed in two scenarios or stages. One, the revelatory work of the Holy Spirit. I like that term, revelatory or revelatory grace. Okay. I think this is very obvious from the Bible that no one can come to the Father except through the Son, and no one can know the Son in a salvific sense except through the revelatory work of the Holy Spirit. Right? I would include in those verses, uh, Romans 10, by the way. This should not be controversial for any Christian. Two, supernatural enablement of the Holy Spirit to accept Christ. In this scenario, the person is dead and needs a spiritual transformation, partial regeneration, to make him a true Christian. This scenario is also not controversial. Well, I, I think it could be controversial. The Bible teaches that the Spirit of God regenerates us during salvation. The real question is whether faith in Christ is possible. Oh, I see what they're saying. So in other words, this enabling of the Holy Spirit either takes place before or after the, the faith in Christ. And so in other words, what they're trying to say, it seems like, is yes, yes, there's an inner ontological change of nature, but it happens post-faith, not pre-faith. So yeah, I, I would agree with that, that assessment. The real question is whether faith in Christ is possible, impossible without such transformation. Or if a person can have faith post stage one and then be born again after at the point of putting faith in Christ. I affirm scenario one. I affirm that the Holy Spirit regenerates us upon putting faith in Jesus, though I don't think regeneration is necessary precursor for true faith. I believe faith precedes regeneration. And people regularly reject Christ in stage one as the Spirit of God is always at work in everyone's heart. I am not clear from the interview where exactly your position you position yourself on this, and I don't think Leighton Flowers will reject scenario one. Correct on that. I, I, I'm emphasizing the sufficiency of scenario one is what I'm doing. 
And Roger Olson replies, we definitely agree on scenario one. Beyond that, it gets difficult to tell. The word supernatural seemed to be a sticking point, and he's, he's, he's right there, and when used for the work of the Holy Spirit in prevenient grace, and I would agree with that, that point. And then there's some back and forth, but I've got to stop. I can already I can feel my, my, my throat hurting here, so I'm, I'm going to bring that to a close. And, uh, and uh, by the way, the only verse that he ever really appeals to is John 6, 44. And, and I would, if, if Roger Olson happens to watch this, I'm not expecting him to do so, but if he happens, I would love for him to go listen to my interview with David Paulman, who is an Arminian, uh, at least self-proclaimed Arminian, but he even agrees with our uh, interpretation of John 6, 44, as, as talking about how God would, the Father would draw to the Son those who have listened and learned from the Father, and that that's what's in context there, is that he's, the drawing there is not prevenient grace, i.e. this this work of ontological change of nature causing people to have the ability they once lost, um, but instead that the drawing there is in reference to God drawing or giving uh, believers in him to the Son. In other words, not arbitrarily or unilaterally just picking people and giving them to the Son so that they believe, but taking believers, people who listen and learn, and giving them to the Son, like Cornelius or Lydia would have been God worshipers that obviously he would want to give to the Son, uh, reveal the Son to them. And so that many of you, if you're not familiar with uh, with my position on that, go watch some of those videos because we, we spend, a lot, uh, spend a lot of time talking through John 6 on several other episodes. David, yes, we are translating uh, some material into Spanish. In fact, right now we are working to publish uh, The Potter's Promise in Spanish. Um, Caleb is, is working with uh, some artists and others and a translator on that right now as we speak. So, yes, that is coming. So hang on to that. And uh, as always, um, when we, uh, you know, we, we want to help spread the news of God's love and provision and, and s- doing this in other languages helps us to do that. And so uh, when you share this, when you like these videos, uh, when you put them on social media, if you know both languages and can translate things, feel free. You have my permission to translate the blog articles and other things. Uh, Just give credit where credit's due. Obviously, point people back to the resources, original resources, so that people can find us who who may be bilingual and those kinds of things. We want this word out there. So feel free to to share that as you can. And remember, if you can support us, um, click on the support link, become a patron. We need all the help we can get to spread the news of God's love and provision. Go now, share Christ, and show love. God bless.